So we have uh, Jack McGinley, a uh, distinguished uh, historian here, um, uh, leading light of the Irish Labour History Society to address us on that. So, Kurigi uh, Fáilte Rev Jack McGinley. Arthur, Tom, Fair Bray, Sultan, Kurra, Gahan Shaw, and you. And um, on behalf of the Irish Labour History Society, uh, I want to thank you for the invitation um, to be here today. Colleagues, the Irish Times of the 24th of April 1918 records Ireland and conscription thus. Yesterday, no manner of work was done in Dublin or in the rest of Ireland outside of North East Ulster. The mandate of last Saturday's Labour conference was observed strictly and with complete success. Labour was withdrawn from every process of trade and industry. There were no trains except on the Great Northern Railways, no trams, no van deliveries, no restaurants, no drink or tobacco, no theatres or picture houses. No, no newspapers were printed in Dublin yesterday. Some of them were in sympathy with the anti-conscription movement, but in all cases the Irish Times shared the common fate. The general withdrawal of labour made publication quite impossible. It was a remarkable experience. This sudden standstill of work, a day life for about three million of people. And we may consider it from at least three points of view. In the first place, we may admit that the demonstration was impressive in its thoroughness and very well organised. Nothing is easier than to be idle, but it's not so easy to keep Satan from making his traditional use of idleness. The conduct of the idle population in Dublin yesterday was quiet and peaceable, and no incidents of disorder are reported from the country districts. If we regard the demonstration from another point of view, that of organised labour, it was still more impressive. The Roman Catholic Church and the nationalist, nationalist leaders have united Nationalist Ireland against conscription. But in so doing, they have achieved other results which, though perhaps unintentional, will give them plenty of food for thought in the near future. They have taken full responsibility for the policy and conduct of Sinn Féin, and they have given organised labour the chance it has been seeking since the time of, that James Larkin bequeathed his mantle to James Connolly. It was the voice of labour, not the voice of religion or of politics, which yesterday stopped the wheels of industry in Dublin, made a desert of the quays, turned the trams off the streets, extinguished for 12 hours the existence of three great railway companies. Yesterday witnessed the first general strike of labour in Ireland, and it was a notable success. On many previous occasions, Labour tried to do some of the things which it did yesterday, but failed because it was only Labour. Now it, was done, now it has done them all simultaneously by reason of its new partnership with religion and politics. Some of its former opponents were on its side for the moment, and it has taken full advantage of its opportunity. The success of its first great venture in peculiarly favourable circumstances has made it conscious of its strength. It may choose to imply that strength on another occasion when the present partnership has ceased to exist, even perhaps at the expense of some of its present partners. We think that April the 23rd will be chiefly remembered not as the day that National Ireland proclaimed its spiritual and moral isolation, but it's the day when Ireland Labour found itself. In April 1918, James Larkin Sr. was in the USA. His lieutenant and comrade James Connolly had been executed on May 12, 1916 by Crown forces operating in Ireland following the East Easter Rising. William O'Brien was moving in the direction of Larkin's seat in Liberty Hall. Many of the men who struck or were locked out during 1913 in Dublin were blacked by employers, and the only work they could get was by serving in the British Army. The report of the Congress of the ITUC held in City Hall, Waterford on 6th to the 8th of August 1918 accepted a report from the Standing Orders Committee 
reporting that there were 240 delegates present, representing a membership of 253,000. This was 1,260 fewer delegates than attended the Special Delegate Conference in the Mansion House, Dublin, on the 20th of April. Trade Union Voice. Divine 2009 lists the strength of the Irish Transport and General Workers Union in February as 25,000, rising to 43,788 in June in 60 branches, 67,000 members by the end of 1918 in 210 branches, and a peak of 100,000 by the spring of 1919. Membership of the Irish Women Workers Union topped 5,000 members. Divine also advises that the membership of ITUC for the years 1918 was 250,000, up 100,000 on the 1917 figures of 150,000. And at that Congress, there were 59 trade unions and 16 trades councils listed. This is a list of the key dates in terms of March through to Armistice Day in November uh, 1914 in relation to what happened. And the key dates for us are the 8th of April, the proposal by Alfie Bourne, amended by Lark and Sherlock at the Dublin Corporation, which was carried. The 14th of April, a protest at the Custom House in Belfast, attended by between 8 and 10,000 workers. The bill passes in the House of Commons on the 16th of April. On the 17th of April, a second protest in Belfast was attacked by loyalist workers. On the 18th, you had the Mansion House Conference set up by Tom Johnson when he was appointed secretary, and the Catholic Hierarchy meeting at Minute, and the Military Services No. 2 Act 1918, the 8th of George V carried. On the 19th, Patrick McCartan and Sinn Féin won the Offaly by-election unopposed, and on the 20th, you had a special delegate conference of the ITUC attended by 1,500 delegates. That still to this day is the biggest attendance of trade unionists at any event. Uh, and considering that there are 850,000 trade unionists in Ireland now, the conferences uh, which, which go on on a biennial uh, basis uh, now only really accommodate about 400 or 420 delegates. So that shows you the strength of feeling uh, in relation to that gathering. Uh, the one-day strike on the 23rd of April, uh, a famous uh, anti-conscription meeting at Balladrain, which has been previously mentioned. Uh, the 9th of June, Women's Day, uh, the uh, conference in Waterford between the 5th and the 8th, and then the uh, ILP special conference in relation to the upcoming um, election. And on the 11th of November, Uh, we had a situation where armistice was declared effective from 11 a.m. World War I ends. Liberty Hall was attacked by a party of soldiers whose purpose was to torch the, torch the building and the citizen army drove off their attackers. Andrew Boyd in his seminal work, The Rise of the Irish uh, Trade Unions, relates the following about the events. The Irish Trade Unions emerged in the mid-19th century to play their part in what were called the New Model Unions. In 1918, the Irish Trade Union Congress organised a general strike against conscription in Ireland. Altogether, it is an extraordinary record of organisation and agitation. The oldest report on the conscription issue is from W.P. Ryan, 1919, in which he states, when the conscription menace loomed over Ireland in April 1918, the attitude of organised Irish labour showed clear and striking straight away. Through a special congress, one of the greatest in the history of the movement, through its delegates on the Mansion House Conference, through the voice of Labour and otherwise, it declared decisively that no outside authority would compel Irish workers to be conscripts. It resolved on unflinching resistance, come what might. The one-day strike which it called for the 23rd of April as a token of its resolution was effected with effective unanimity over the greatest part of Ireland. All but the Orange and Loyalist quarters in the northeast quarter of Ireland, of Ulster, and that memorable illustration of the workers' power that day, when Ireland did nothing and did it with a vengeance, had a profound effect. 
The giant at rest taught a lesson and pointed a model more effective than a generation's labor of the giant in activity. Padraig Gates, without doubt one of the foremost labor historians of our generation, has recently written of this period. There are probably few major events in 20th century Irish history which have received less attention than the general strike against conscription. Yet it was not alone the first general strike in Irish history and the most significant sim single demonstration of public opposition to the measure, but had serious implications for the Irish labor movement. Yates also states that following the introduction of conscription bill in the House of Commons, Tom Johnson and David Campbell lobbied the TUC in London on the matter, organized the first anti-conscription protest in Ireland on Saturday the 14th of April at Customs House in Belfast. Uh, do I um, call a uh, comment on the Unionist loyalist side, uh, which was uh, said thus, the dislocation of trade and industry to be a monstrous crime the dis uh, and an inexplicable disgrace when the war was at its most critical point. The conscription crisis consequently highlighted the division among Irish workers on the fault line of the national question. The Irish Transport and General Workers Union describes the union's full, full strength and its far-ranging influence to the remotest districts uh, in the island were demonstrated in spectacular fashion in the general strike of the 23rd of April. This was the first mass protest made in any European country against the war measure and was called by the NEC of the ITUC and LP after the introduction in the British Parliament of a manpower bill to enforce conscription in Ireland, endorsed by a special conference and resolved by a general strike of 24 hours. As a demonstration of fealty to the cause of labour in Ireland, as a sign of their resolve to resist the application of the Conscription Act for the purpose of enabling every man and woman to sign the pledge. Now, Liz has already spoken on Women's Day. Uh, the only thing I liked of what she said was that there was an event outside the Ch uh, Church of Ireland, uh, probably St. Patrick's Cathedral, at which a number of Church of Ireland people had given notice to the, uh, the Dean that they wished um, to be associated with, with, with the signature of the pledge. And when they arrived at the cathedral, it was locked. Um, they got down on their knees and they did what they had to do and in the lashings of rain. And when, when they arose, they found the doors opening and they went with a copy of the pledge to present uh, to the religious gentleman who tore it up and threw it back in their faces. So that, that, that was the, the difference between uh, what was happening at that time. Uh, this is a copy of the pledge. I, I hope it's an original and it's down in the archives in the Labour History Society. Everybody, a number of people have spoken about what the pledge is and these are the words that Liz also spoke about, uh, the Women's Pledge. In relation to um, the position of organised labour and its greatest error, Dermot Ferter advises the coverage in the Freeman's Journal thus, the call for a general strike reported that it was a success, the response to it was most remarkable, uh, with not just trade unions down in tools, but shops were shut, railways and postal services ceased, and in Dublin all trams and vehicular traffic uh, were stopped. In a lecture delivered before the ILHS in 2014 entitled Hostility, Indignation and Fury, previous president and labour history activist Brendan Bourne uh, said of the anti-conscription campaign of 1918 and the general strike of the 23rd of April, public reaction in Ireland uh, of 1918 to the British government proposal to introduce a draft military services bill was summarised best in a local report from the county inspector of the RIC in North Tipperary when describing the attitude of the local population to that ill-fated decision as being one of hostility, indignation and fury. And finally, the cause of labour. De Valera quoted by Cahill, 1990, when we wanted the help of labour against conscription, labour gave it to us. When we wanted the help of labour in Bern, labour gave it to us.